All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Thriving Adoptees podcast. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Carl. Thank you very much for making time for uh, for this in your schedule, uh, Carl. I really uh, uh, appreciate it. I'm looking forward to our, our conversation. Oh, so am I, Simon, and, and thanks so much. It's uh, always, it's, there's never, I never have to ask, ask twice to talk about my kids. So um, anytime, yeah. my pleasure. A proud dad. Yes, 100%. Yeah. <laughs> a, a, a proud dad. Yeah. So uh, could you introduce yourself to the audience, please, Carl? Sure. Happy to. So uh, I'm Carl Smith. Um, I'm the, uh, the parents of two children, one biological, our son, and our younger daughter, uh, Katie, who we adopted from China. Um, Katie's now 19 years old, and uh, we've had her since she was 15 months. And, um, you know, happy to say that uh, both kids are doing outstanding, um, despite their parents' shortcomings, uh, and um, are, doing, are doing very well and making us proud every day. Yeah. We, we always have, I, I, I say this a lot because we, because it's true, right? We only have big hearted people uh, on, on the show. But another thing that I guess is one of the things that uh, that I see, you know, I hear a lot of is modesty. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, uh, you know, we we are we're uh, modest, and I think the word is self self effacing. You know? Yes, uh, yeah, I think that it's approach. a good it's a good approach to have. <laughs> yeah, it's because it's it is it is clearly all about the about the kids. So yeah, um, so what? Uh, what comes to mind when you hear the the term "thriving adoptees," Carl? Um, I have to say, if you say "thriving adoptees," um, it's not surprising, and uh, I think that's because parents who have made the decision, the bold decision, to uh, open their hearts and their homes to uh, another child, um, they they've thought it through and they. Um, you know, they, they've done everything, they're going to do everything they can to make sure that that child does thrive. So um, when I think of that, I, I think, yep, that's what I would expect. And when I see stories of uh, fellow parents who have adopted and their kids are doing outstanding, I'm thinking, yep, that's, that's about what I would have expected. And it, you know, makes me happy that um, I can, I can put myself in that same category. Yeah. That's cool. What, because uh, these expectations are so they're so big, aren't they? Um, mm. uh, and we were talking before before we uh, hit the record button about the the fact that we have we seem to have a, 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 a very negative bias within within our media across mm. all the topics, all the content, uh, all the stories that get covered in in the media seem to be very negative, and they seem to take a negative uh, approach to adoption as well. And I guess that uh, it, I guess that puts people off adoption. Um, I was just talking today with a, a guy who's coming on the podcast in a, in a couple of weeks' time, a guy called uh, Sam Barnes, and he was saying that there are uh, eight hundred thousand um, abortions every mm. year in, in the US, and only twenty thousand adoption. Mm -hmm. yeah. So. The um, and I, I so some things going on somehow in terms of how adoption is depicted um, and uh, with it within the media that's putting that's yeah I, I I you know and it's, it's interesting Simon you say that because I I think one of the you know you have to look at it from both sides right somebody who's who's pregnant and looking to put their child up for adoption and the other and I only know the I only know the side of the adoptive parent yeah so i mean that's something you know obviously i can speak speak to um the the challenge on the adoption side is there's two parts to it i think one is the emotional part and two is the um pragmatic logistical part so the pragmatic part is it is a process um you know it took us 18 months from start to finish with paperwork and approvals and everything to um to finally get katie adopted and that's an international adoption, but I you know, know plenty of people who've adopted domestically who have similar stories about the, the challenges, the logistical challenges uh, and roadblocks that they come up against. And um, you really kind of have to, you have to be determined to kind of get through those. Um, 
you know, the emotional part for the adoptive parent, I think, um, and I, I think this is a stigma. And I think one of the things is a stigma and that's that some people say, well, um, adoption is my second choice. You know, I can't have kids so I'm going to adopt and they almost see it as a consolation prize. And I think that puts people off um, when I think really, uh, you know, looking back on it, um, you know, we, it's a great first choice. You know, there's, um, I tell people this all the time, honestly, having a biological child to a degree is somewhat selfish. We don't need more people on the planet. There's plenty of people on the planet. The problem is there's not enough people to care for them. Um, so I think, you know, there's a, I think there's a, some people have, for whatever reason, kind of have in their heads that maybe it's, you know, uh, um, they failed in some way because they're adopting when in fact, I think they're actually succeeding. So I do think we have to flip that script to get people to understand what an outstanding thing it is for you as a parent to have an adoptive child and what a great opportunity is um, to, to really kind of a positive impact on the world. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That's huge, isn't it? Yeah. Um, flipping, flipping the script. Yeah, because I think that that's, you know, the, the, um, I think the, there, there, there can be a stigma to that, but I, I you know, um, you know, from, uh, so here, I'll, I'll tell you, I mean, I'm a, I'm a storyteller, so I'll, I'll share a story with you. Um, when we were going through the process of adopting Katie, um, my wife was still going through fertility treatments. So she went to, you know, she went to an appointment to see one of the doctors there and she's in a waiting room full of you know, women who are going through the same thing. And uh, of course they're talking and, um, my wife starts to talk about our, you know, we're, we're going through the adoption process. We're going to get a little girl from China. And um, one, of the, one of the women just burst into tears. And my wife said, what's, what's wrong? She said, I really wanted to do that. Um, but my husband said he couldn't raise a child who didn't look like him. And that's, my wife said, she just like her jaw dropped. She didn't know what to say um, because it never occurred it would have never occurred to me that that was an issue and it, it clearly isn't for us. Um, but that's the kind of stigma that some people have, you know, it's not, you know, the child doesn't look like me. It's, uh, they don't make that connection. So, um, you know, I, I can't imagine, I mean, now that I, I have, I have an adoptive daughter, I can't imagine a life without her and I can't imagine her not being a you know part of my life. Um, but I don't know, I don't know where that comes from. I don't know where some people have that, why someone would have that feeling, but um, you know, that's, uh, that is, that's part of the stigma and that's the script we have to flip that, um, you know, uh, that people have that feeling. We actually had somebody, this is an amazing story. Um, Katie was young, maybe, you know, a couple years old and she's out with my wife and one of, uh, one of the other moms said, are you gonna tell her she's adopted? Now we're both blonde hair, blue eyes and Katie is obviously Chinese. And my wife just looked at it and said, if, if, if she can't figure out she's adopted by looking at her pants, we probably have some other issues we're going to have to deal with. Yeah. But um, yeah, so that, I, I, that's a big part of it, Simon, I think is, um, you know, educating people that this is something they can do and should do and talking more about the positive impact you're having on your own life, let alone the child's life, let alone society, the larger society. Yeah um this is so huge uh be before we i mean you, you, and it's such a it's such a big point uh of this um because as a as a uh, as a white guy that mm -hmm. was adopted by white parents i didn't i i obviously i didn't have that inter interracial or international uh d a dimension to my adoption mm -hmm. um it seems to often present or, or, or add, a, add another layer of complexity into the into the mix in the adoption. Uh, oh, a hundred percent. I mean, I, I can. So I think there's. I'll, I'll paint two pictures for you. Um, so the pastor at our church had done and both an international and a domestic adoption, and as we were going through the process with Katie, she said her challenge with the domestic adoption was um, the fear that someone was going to just show up at her door and take her child away. 
um, that's you know, someone had changed their mind or whatever. And she said, every time someone knocked at the door, and when you're a pastor's wife, someone's always knocking at the door, um, that someone was going to, you know, that that person was there to take this child, the domestically adopted child away. Um, on, in our circumstance, part of what we had to prepare ourselves for was explaining to Katie what happened. You know, she's a product of uh, China's one child policy. Um, and from the very beginning, you know, in terms that she could understand, and those terms, of course, change as she got older, because she can understand more, of course, we explained to her what happened and why uh, she was abandoned and why she was available for adoption and why people were adopting children from China. Um, and that created some very difficult conversations, it, difficult but important and necessary, and um, I think helped her. I think helped her have a, a, a healthy, a healthy view of being adopted. Um, you know, as much as we can and have been able to, we've tried to expose her to as much of her native culture as we can. As again, as, as two Caucasian people who don't have a lot of history in the Chinese culture, we've tried to expose her to some of that and make her proud of, uh, as anybody should be proud of where they've come from. Um, but that that took some thought on our, you know, on our part before she even arrived on how were we going to handle that? How were we going to handle, you know, talking about her story and helping her understand that? And, um, you know, like I think like anything with parenting, you know, you try to prepare for it and then you ad adjust as you have to. But um, it's the, the, the racial thing is a thing. I mean, and that's something we have to do. So um, when COVID hit. Um, our daughter was, of course, in high school. Uh, she was a senior when, you know, when the world came to a stop. Um, and she came home one day from school before everything totally got shut down. And they were calling it the Chinese virus, right? Um, and she said, she's shaking her head. She goes, some of the kids at my school, she goes, I don't know what to, what to say to them. I said, why is that? She said, some of the kids won't sit at my lunch table because of the Chinese virus, because I'm Chinese. <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, they're there's something I'm never going to have to deal with, right? But, you know, she was strong enough and confident. Enough. She just kind of shrugged her shoulders and said, you know, like, what? I can't do anything about that and just kind of let it roll off her, uh, roll off her back. But, um, yeah, there, there have been some things like that you kind of have to, you have to help her through. But I do think as a parent, like anything, whether it's, um, you know, what you're going to, what you're going to do as far as electronics or what you're going to do, when can they get a cell phone? These are discussions you have as a parent um, with your partner and kind of try to sort through all that. Yeah. So what, um, uh, you talked about some, you talked about some challenges and mm -hmm. um, rising to the, uh, rising to those challenges. One of the things that I, that I really love to do with the uh, Thriving Adoptees podcast is to empower other people Mm -hmm. uh, empower adoptive parents listening uh, so that we can kind of like um, ho hopefully give them a, a, a helping hand along their own learning curve by sharing the learnings of of, of people that have been uh, have been before them on this mm -hmm. journey mm -hmm. so what what would you like to what would you like to share in terms of uh, ad what you've learned raising katie i mean you were saying that she's she's just gone into the uh in, into the military um she just started she, in the yeah US she, just Force. Started, she just started at the united states air force academy um you know she did a year at the prep school now she's at the academy so she'll do four years graduate with her degree and then you'll be commissioned as an officer wow um so so okay so let me i'll thread all that together Simon. so thank you for teeing that up um so we knew one of the challenges with Katie was going to be this whole story on why, um, you know, why. Um, and my counsel to any, uh, you know, adoptive parent would be to think through how you're going to handle that. And our, again, our approach was to be as honest and open as we could about what we knew, what we didn't know, and what happened. So Katie knew about the one child policy pretty early on. Um, she knew that um, and this is how these things can, can actually, I think, build the character of your child. Um, so she knew that uh, her, her birth parents 
in some way, we're you know, clearly not at the top of the socioeconomic ladder because in China, you can have more than one child if you're at that point. Um, but clearly they weren't. So they had, she was abandoned. Um, but what we told her was somebody must have really cared for you a great deal because to be, you know, to, if you're caught abandoning a child, it's a capital offense, as we were told. So somebody took a fairly big risk to try and save you. And they put her in a spot um, outside a TV radio station where the police would come by because they knew that's where kids would be left. So they, you know, they put her in a, um, a position where she was likely to be found. So we, you know, we said, obviously, care, someone cared. It could have been the mother, the father, grandmother, who knows, but somebody cared enough to not just, you know, sadly, you know, dispose of her, which does happen. Um, and how that had an impact on Katie moving forward is Katie has a real heart for caring for people. So, um, you know, when she would come home from gymnastics over, you know, right across the river, she had put together blessing bags. And she would stop where she knew the homeless people were in Trenton and uh, hand them a bag. You know, I'd have a blanket in it, uh, maybe a, a, uh, you know, some food or some snacks or some soap or something like that. Um, that's, uh, that's kind of, so that was clearly a part of what she learned from her upbringing. The other thing, Katie, is um, she's keenly dialed into finances. She's always been a saver. She, uh, she's, she's all about collecting money and, and, and kind of growing it. And that's because she always wants to be in a position where she'll have enough money because she realized her parents, birth parents did not. So that has kind of made her a financially savvy young lady. She's thinking about how she can earn money and then put it to, put it to good use. Um, the other thing that she learned through her this process of us being honest with her and, and telling her how, you know, how the whole thing went down is um, that's how she got interested in uh, military service. So she saw her brother go to the, the uh, United States Naval Academy. She saw the opportunities that presented and she said, I'd like that idea. And um, you know, she applied to all the academies here, uh, you know, the West Point and the Coast Guard and uh, Navy and, and Air Force, landed on the Air Force. Um, and now she wants to fly what they call the heavies, which are the big cargo planes, because she thinks that those, those people, the officers who pilot those planes are the ones who, who bring things to people who need them or help people in need. So by being honest with her and upfront about that in, the, in ways that made sense to her, again, you know, the story had to evolve as she got older. Um, I think it really shaped the character of who she is. Um, you know, but there were some there were some difficult times during that that period where she would say, you know, uh, I, I don't know what my parents looked like. And I can remember my wife being up at three or four in the morning and sitting her on the sink in the bathroom and saying, look in the mirror and look, she says, that's the, your parents are in that face right there. And, you know, um, that helped her that helped her kind of wrap her head around that. The other thing we told her was. Um, it's okay to be upset about this. And, you know, when she was old enough, she got into her teen years, we said, look, this is one thing we're never going to be able to solve for you. And this is a burden you will have to carry. Um, but we all have them. So, you know, my wife shared some things that she's had to carry through her life. Uh, I shared things that I had to carry through my life. And that helped her understand that, you know, just because you're, you're sitting looking around the cafeteria, all these kids aren't living a perfect life. They're all carrying something. So you're in that way, you're just like every other kid. Um, you know, you have, you've had some challenges and you have some things you have to carry around that someone's not going to understand, but so does everyone else you meet. Um, so that, that, I guess that would, in short order, that's what I would say is, um, you know, think of how you want to, how you want to communicate that with your, with your child and, um, you know, be honest with them and, 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 let them acknowledge that they have things that they, they don't understand or things that bother them or uh, questions they have that you may not have the answer to. Sometimes saying that uh, can be the best thing you can say as a parent is, you know, I don't know, but I'm, 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 I'm here to struggle through it with you. Yeah. Wow. There's so much that. Um, I think the, 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 the first thing that came to me was uh, in terms of unpacking what you said was the honesty piece. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and in particular, the fact that um, 
you were honest that um how should i put it that this that you weren't going to be able to solve some of these challenges right right that's, so that's tough, that's tough you, as a parent right you i mean you know you're you think as a parent you're supposed to have all the answers and um you know i think we need to give ourselves a break and, and i think it's also fair for your children to understand that um your know, mom and dad don't have all the answers it's we're we're parents we're not perfect yeah so i mean it, it there's honesty there's honesty there mm -hmm. and there's a there's a sense of uh realism as well mm -hmm. uh, uh and as you said before we started recording it's not all uh, it's not all unicorns right. um so that is a key a key lesson i guess for for all of us really is a you know a, a, a little bit of um realism the, the other thing that i really liked about what you said was there was some vulnerability in there mm. in terms of uh, daring to share some of your own tricky stuff mm -hmm. um, and I think that that is uh, you know if if we're you know we want to be we want to be we want to be leaders and leaders go first mm -hmm. leaders share their empathy share their vulnerability and Share share some of their share some of their challenges, and that kind of normalizes it. Because if we are always positive, unrealistic, then we're setting our kids up to 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 fail because they won't see their. When they're feeling uh, troubled or where they're when they're struggling, they won't see that as normal. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and that's you know the the and the challenge that the kids now are dealing with that you and I didn't have to deal with growing up is they're watching social media. Right. So you know the best description of social media I've read is that it's a highlight film. So if you go through social media and you see all your friends are posting these amazing pictures about how awesome everything is, and you're like, well, my life isn't always awesome. Then you said, you know, they, they're, they're, that's only going to frustrate them and, and, you know, kind of depress them that how come I don't have that life. But if they have that sense that, um, you know, in, in, in real life, in real time, um, it's not always like that. That, that, that to your point, it normalizes it. I think that's a good way to put it. It normalizes it. So for, for me to be able to tell Katie, um, you know, my mom passed away when I was, uh, when I was 11 years old, I said, and I told her, I said that, I said, that's the thing I have to carry around. And it, cause it changed my life in ways I'll never, I probably won't ever understand completely, but I know it was, uh, you know, life-changing experience. I said, so, and I said, it was very hard. I said, it was some dark times, you know, as an 11 year old boy. And she, and I, I know she appreciated it cause she's talked to me about that since I shared that with her, um, and a couple of times she would say, you know, I'm sorry you went through that. I'm like, well, I'm, I'm sorry I can't take you to see your birth parents. I wish I wish I could. So I do think that's it. I think normalizing it and, and showing that vulnerability makes kids understand that, it, that it's, again, it's okay to carry that around with you because you're not the only one carrying something around. Yeah. The, um, I, I heard uh, a mentor of mine talked about the social media uh, mm as uh, you know and this uh the highlights and the highlights film the highlights reel as you uh, as yeah. you put it so succinctly um he said it's like we're what what's going on is we're comparing uh our insides with somebody else's outside that's i think that's a hundred percent yeah a hundred percent yeah it's a hundred percent yeah because um that, and, the, and the thing is, if that's what you see, so think about it, if the, the you know, if, if media, and I use that as a broad term, so television, movies, magazines, uh, whatever, always present that perfect image. And that now is only being amplified through social media and um, reality television, reality in air quotes. Um, that's what the kids, that's a steady diet that they, they get. Um, 
And if that if that's all, you know, and it's no fault of theirs. If no one is there to counter that, if no one is there to kind of pull back the curtain and talk about what's behind, um, who's to blame them for expecting that to be their reality? I mean, that's part of what our job as parents is for, for good or ill, right? It's a part of us to say, look, that's not true. You know, everyone's carrying these burdens and these, these challenges. Um, on the other side, uh, you know, it's up to us to say, here's some things you're capable of doing that you might not have thought you were capable of doing. Um, you know, uh, Katie was lucky enough to see her brother, uh, you know, get accepted to receive an appointment to the Naval Academy. And, you know, I think that would have never occurred to her if that hadn't happened. That sparked her interest in um, military veterans, which sparked her um, her gold award project for the Girl Scouts, which, uh, you know, she, when she was looking for that, that project, she said, I want to do something for our military veterans. And um, this is kind of a tangent, but I think it shows the kind of person she's grown into. Um, and most of the people were saying, well, you can lay some wreaths at this place, or you could put a plaque up here. And she said, oh, I want to do something that has an impact. So it took us a while, but we found somebody who had purchased a, um, uh, what's called the Veterans Comfort House here in Philadelphia, which was a transitional homeless shelter for military veterans. And Katie went down, met with the person, and they said, listen, uh, Katie had said, I, I thought, how about if I build like a, like a, so, uh, set some up a library for them? Well, the uh, person who purchased said, look, you can do anything you want in this family room. And fast forward, she built a, um, a 94 square foot library and activity center for these, uh, it ended up being a home for 13 uh, female homeless veterans, a transitional homeless shelter. This 94 foot um, uh, center that had hundreds of books and puzzles and games uh, and you know just a gorgeous piece of furniture. She pulled the team together because she wanted to have an impact and help people. Um, and I think that's because she, she learned that you know, people are struggling and that you know, she kind of pulled it all together. She had a heart for the military. She had a heart to help people. Um, and that's in no small part because we let her know that um, there are people out there, everybody out there is carrying a, a struggle or a burden. And um, you, know, you, you, you can have an impact to help that. Yeah. yeah. So where did this, I mean, where did this, where do you think this came from? Did it come from you? I mean, I, 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 so, I mean, I wish I could take credit for it, but, um, you know, I think it's really just something that, you know, she kind of pulled together, uh, from, you know, it wasn't directional, you know, both our kids ended up at a military academy and, you know, that, which is a challenge, you know, the acceptance rate at those places is usually less than 10%. So how they set their sights on that is beyond me. Um, and for Katie, I think it really came down to when, when, if you look at her essay that she wrote for her congressional appointments um, and for her applications, it all centered around um, her adoptive experience. Um, so part of us being honest with her and talking with her about that constantly, it's a central part of who she is and she knows that. And she shared that with um, you know, the, the congressional appointment committees and the, the senator's appointment committees that you know, I went through the adoption process and she will tell you that she realizes that this country gave her a second chance and it's a, you know, all the opportunities. And that's why she wanted to be a military officer. So how can I do something to give back to this country that's given me so much? And as a military officer, I can not only help my country, but I can, I can lead other people and I can help them with whatever they're struggling with and accomplish things that are in turn going to help other people. Yeah. Um, now that obviously that was not our end game, our end point, but uh, just by virtue of being honest and forthright about her situation and um, you know, about being vulnerable enough to, as you said, normalize carrying a burden, I think that helped shape her and uh, you know, put her where she is now. Yeah. So yeah, I think the key word um, that you said for me in terms of what the what the uh, the recruiters saw is they saw her, um, they saw her, they saw they sorry, they saw her talent for leadership mm -hmm. and, and a desire and, and a desire to 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 serve serve the serve the country. So yep. they prob that probably 
ticks two of the major boxes. Um, but they could see, they also saw the backstory to that. Mm -hmm. So they saw her um, honesty and they saw she was put, putting her cards on the table mm -hmm. from a, a genuine, with, a, with, a, with, with genuine depth. Yes, absolutely. I, I think I think you're 100 percent right. And again, that I think that all comes from um, early on uh, helping her understand that. And that's um, you know that's all part of the journey. I mean, um, you know, we we've gone through this both directions, adoptive and biological. And in both cases, I think just being vulnerable to your kids and honest um, and open, I think sets them up to kind of discover. The person they're meant to be and help them uh, kind of set a path forward for themselves yeah i mean i, I me and my missus haven't got any kids all right so um i i'm but i'm a big fan of vulnerability because i think vulnerability is kind of the key to relatability mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. empathy mm -hmm. um but i kind of get the sense from my friends that are parents I, well i don't really get a sense of them being like that mm. I, I but i don't am i am i under am i underplaying it or no i i, I no. You, you probably have a i think you have a clear view on that simon i think some parents believe um they have to come across to their children as the great and powerful oz the all-knowing all-seeing right that they have all the answers and, um, you know, they never want the child to, and I think it's about the child doubting them. They, they don't, they always want to have the child have confidence that they've got it figured out. And I think that's a balancing act. Um, I always want my children to feel safe and comfortable that, you know, we have things under control. And, but I also think it's reasonable for them to know that we're human so that, um, frankly, if you set yourself up to know it all and, uh, you're setting yourself up for failure and your child for disappointment because at some point, um, you know, it's going to come out. But yeah, I, I do think some parents um, maybe take that role as um, parent maybe a little too seriously that they have to have all the answers and um, not, not let their children know that they're sometimes nervous, sometimes uh, scared, um, you know, sometimes tired, oftentimes tired. Um, I, I do think that's, I think that's something of just, you know, giving ourselves a break as a parent. And I, I in the long run, I think children, as they grow older, uh, I think they appreciate that, 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 that they know that their parents are being honest with them. So again, to your point, I think it's about them understanding as they get older, it's okay not to know. Um, and look, I, I'll be honest. I, so when my son was applying to the Naval Academy, he said, so dad, he goes, I got this application. He goes, do you think I'll get in? I said, absolutely not. And some people were really stunned. They said, well, I can't believe you said that to your son. I looked at my son and said, I'm just doing the math here. The acceptance rate to last year's class was 7%. So the math is 93% of people applied didn't get in. And he looked at me and said, all right. And he, it didn't, it didn't depress him. It didn't deter him. And obviously he, he would not only receive the appointment, he accepted it and graduated. But um, I think if I had not been as honest with him over the course of his life, I think it would have shocked him for me to say that. But because he knew I was being honest, um, you know, I think that's part of what we do as parents. We help set expectations. And I think that's, you know, I think that can be challenging for parents because we, you know, we, again, we always want the kids to think we have all the answers and, um, you know, but the fact is we don't. I think if you're honest about that, I think in the end, I think your kids will respect that and appreciate it. Yeah. Because if they... Uh, well, if they think that you have all the answers, then they're not going to be. They're going to feel a bit off when they don't have the answers themselves. That's exactly right. The expectation that you're building in your kids, if you pretend you have all the answers, is when I get to be older, I should have all the answers. And yeah. I, you know, um, and a lot of times I'll say to the kids, I don't know, let's just talk about it and let's put out what we do know. And what some of the considerations are, you know, and we'll 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 figure it out together, or we'll both admit that we both don't know, and let's see what happens. I mean, um, 
you know, part of like one of the, the, the tangents to that is helping them learn that they sometimes have to make decisions that they're not 100% sure of. Sometimes you kind of have to make the best decision. And I've said that, look, we made the best decision we could, didn't quite pan out the way we wanted it to, you know, okay, what have you learned from it? And that's okay. I mean, I think that's part of them learning that it's okay. I, I said this before, as a parent, I think one of the most difficult things to do is to, to watch your child fail. But failure is such a necessary part of your childhood um, that you have to learn as a child, you have to learn how to fail. As a parent, you have to learn how to let your child fail. And, um, you know, they're just going to be stronger for it. But it is, it's incredibly hard. And sometimes it's, you know, they're going, they, they've made a decision. They, they think they've made it for the right reasons. And you think, boy, this is just, this is going to flame out and it flames out. And you just have to kind of be there to help pick up the pieces and help them learn from it. That's, you know, that's, that's just part of being a parent, I think. Yeah. And how has that been different uh, in any way between your biological son and your adopted daughter? Uh, I, to be honest, I mean, I don't know that there's a lot of differences. I mean, the difference is Katie's story, um, but you know, we've we've kind of followed the same pattern with both kids. Um, and, uh, you know, but, you know, both my son and daughter that we've tried to be, you know, honest and vulnerable with them and, um, you know, as necessary and challenge them when necessary and, uh, you know, open them to opportunities. And, um, you know, they've, they've, uh, they both obviously seem to be pretty level-headed kids who, um, you know, who, who are capable of dealing with failure, which I think is outstanding. Um, and both have learned to, to kind of, um, you know, take the good with the bad and to see, uh, see opportunities when they present themselves. And, and, and I would say, I think the thing I'm proudest of with them is they both have a keen sense of empathy. They can look around, realize that they're different because they both are, I'd say are different from your typical kid, um, realize that that's okay. And then have the sense to say, what is going on around me and how can I have a positive impact on that? Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because um, I didn't know whether, way, when you, whether you're going to say there was a difference uh, mm -hmm. or not with that. Because we, uh, a, a lot of, um, a lot of uh, adoptive parenting courses talk about having to parent kids from hard places mm -hmm. differently mm -hmm. so um it's interesting from what you're what you're talking about it and and uh, in this part of the this part of the the the, the, the parenting mm -hmm. uh, story mm -hmm. you're you're not treating the kids any different no, and the, you know, the, the, the biggest difference, Simon, frankly, is that our son was an only child for four years and Katie always had a big brother. So in that way, she always had kind of another resource, for lack of a better term, to go to. You know, she had someone she could look and say, oh, that's how you do things. That's how we do things around here, you know. Um, and I think that was a tremendous asset, uh, you know, um, that she had someone that she could, you know, kind of watch and model behavior and um, see how he questioned things and how he handled things. And, um, you know, I, and I think, I think she was able to see that she was getting pretty much, you know, aside from age different age related differences that she was being treated very much the same as he was. Um, but she, you know, she had the advantage of having an older brother. So I would say that that was, you know, on, on the downside, she didn't get all the attention for four years like he did as an only child. But then again, she also had the advantage of, um, you know, having an older sibling uh, growing up. So that was, uh, that was to her advantage. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, I guess. And four years, that was. Because there's a certain, the, the, there's a, there's going to be a level of maturity. Mm hmm that I'm just thinking like I, I'm two years I'm two years older than my uh, 
than uh, my little sister. But I, I think the, the the sort of the bigger age big, bigger age gap sometimes leads to siblings to be a little bit more responsible. There's less competition somehow. I don't know. Oh, age yeah, gap. I think that's 100. We, we've definitely seen there was there never really was. The kids were not competitive with each other. They're very competitive. They're both athletes, so they're both very competitive, but not with each other. Um, and Noel was from the very when we first started talking about this. He was very excited to get a little sister, and he took that role as big brother very seriously. Even you know, when she first landed, and he was you know five and a half, she was one and a half when she arrived. Um, he took that role very seriously, and the, the age gap worked up pretty perfectly as far as school went. They were in the same school for a year or two, which was good because Katie just started school, of course, when Noah was ending his primary years. Um, they were never in middle school together and they were never in high school together. Um, so helping, being in the same school to kind of help her get started, I think was helpful. And then he kind of paved the road, if you will, for middle school and high school, but she also wasn't in his shadow. You know, it wasn't always, they weren't always together. When, by the time she got to middle school, he was gone. So. You know, they both played in the jazz band, but he wasn't in the jazz band at the same time. So Katie kind of carved out her own space. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that was I think that was definitely helpful. Yeah. Just want to go back to the kind of the international, the interracial mm -hmm. aspect of that, and just um, see if there's anything else that you'd like to like to share in terms of what you you learned along that um, uh, along that journey that you yeah. you think others could could benefit from knowing sure um I, you know i i think i think the thing we again we tried to do was uh is to make sure that we that, that there was nothing to hide there that katie shouldn't um feel like she needed to uh pretend that she wasn't chinese that she wasn't born in China and that her parents were not and that we were adoptive parents and just to be honest and open about that. Um, and again, we exposed her, uh, you know, Katie has, you know, there's, um, uh, she, she's seen, you know, she's gone to live productions of about Chinese culture. We always go to, we, until of course she went out to the Air Force Academy every, you know, Chinese New Year, we'd go down to Chinatown um, for kind of celebration. Um, we celebrate her gotcha day every year. Um, so, you know, we, we exposed now she's not one of these people who's kind of grabbed onto that cultural heritage and made it the most important part of her life, but she's aware of it and we've never tried to hide that from her. Uh, and, you know, we've certainly, you know, as welcomed her to, to explore that as much as she has shown an interest in. Um, so I, you know, that would be the only thing I'd say is there's, um, one, it's a great opportunity, I think, to explore a different culture as a parent, um, so I certainly wouldn't, um, I wouldn't shy away from that. I would, uh, you know, I think, um, I think opening yourself up to the, up to whatever, you know, whatever adoption path makes sense to you, whether it's domestic or, uh, or, or uh, international, um, I, you know, I, I don't think that's, I don't think that should deter anybody. Um, and just, you know, be open to the experience. And uh, if you go down that path, just, um, you know, just share it with your child, I think, in the long run to make them a more confident uh, person. So did you did you say in, in Mr. Lair that you you let her you let her take the lead on the, the level of exploration of this? Yeah. So we you know, we, we you know, once she was younger, of course, we shared stories with her and, um, you know, any kind of um, children's stories out of China, like Stone Soup was one or uh, a couple other books we you know picked up and exposed her to that and um you know she you know very open to it but um at a certain point it's like okay if you want more we'll do more but you know she seemed very comfortable with the kind of routine we fell in with going to chinese new year and uh, that kind of thing um that was you know that she seemed pretty comfortable she never showed an interest for example in learning the language spoken or written um and that you know, was okay with us um you know her room is decorated with a lot of artifacts that i brought back from our time in china um, you know, scrolls with her, her name paint, her, her given name painted on them, um, that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, we've definitely left that, um, we've definitely left that up to her. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, that is, is, 
it is a matter of feel, is it? I mean, uh, yeah, I, th- I think so. Yeah. I think so. I think it's, you know, that's, um, I think it's important you expose a child to that because they need to know that they can be proud of it. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't want her to not talk about that because she's afraid our feelings will be hurt because we're, you know, she's talking about China and not talking about, you know, uh, being an American. Um, I think that's, you know, I think you can't have to feel that out, but I think giving the child the enough enough space to kind of explore that and decide how much of that they want to do, uh, which really, you know, in a lot of ways is like anything, you know, you expose them to music and uh, theater and sports and books, and they kind of figure out what they want to spend their energy and passion on. And, um, you know, we kind of left it up to her and she, you know, she carved out, I think as much space as she felt was necessary to, you know, to, to make her comfortable. Yeah. Because a lot of times I listen, I, I listen to podcasts uh, mm-hmm. and people are they want the hows, you know, they they want the hows. Everybody, yeah. everything needs to be rationalised right. uh, and uh, and broken down into ten simple steps. And I, I think you know it it's um, it, in in some areas like you know. <laughs> how to wire a plug, you know, <laughs> right. you, you can break it down, but this is far more art. Yeah. This is, this is, this is getting a feel for it and, 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 and being doing what feels comfortable for you as a parent and the, you know, what seems to be comfortable for you. I agree. I think a lot of it is touch and feel and it's a lot more art than science. Um, and yeah, and the other thing as a parent, you know, speaking of vulnerabilities is allow yourself to realize you, you, you might've made a mistake on something. You know, I think some parents feel like they have to do everything perfectly. Um, and I, you know, I, we gave up on that a long time ago. Um, you know, we just, you kind of, you know, as long as you think it through and you do the best you can, I'm not sure anybody can expect anything more from you than that. And, um, you know, hopefully, you're right more often than you're wrong. <laughs> and yeah. uh, kids are usually pretty resilient. They can bounce back. Even if you've made a tactical error, you can kind of recover and still get up to the right spot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think something you talked about resilience earlier on, um, and one of my favorite, one of my favorite things to talk about in terms of this resilience is that the res- resilience is all is always there. We've got this world telling us that uh, who are the world telling us how to be a more resilient parent, you know, and they they have to kind of sell us on something. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, being becoming more resilient is like strengthening a muscle, like part being going to the gym, and and that's how they sell us on their resilience resilient parent skills training course. You know, they it's something that we have to add to, whereas actually resilience is revealed when we go through tricky stuff um and we see ourselves we we see ourselves we see the resilience that we always had in ourselves that Mm -hmm. we had not previously seen so resilience is to put it simply it's unveiled rather than strengthened right and i think that that you know, I always like to think that the experience of having, again, that's why failure is important because like a, to your point to a muscle, you know, you, you fail and you see that, oh, it's okay. I failed. And I got through it. And just mentally and emotionally, it helps you understand that if you see yourself failing again, it's like, you know what, it's going to be okay because I'm, it's not the end of the world. It's going to be okay. And like, so you have resiliency is revealed and you find out that it's okay it's okay to fail and okay to come up short. And you learn that you not only can you bounce back, you will bounce back and, you know, tomorrow will be another day. Yeah. That's a great point to uh, end. I think Carl. Yeah. A great point to end. Thank you very much for, uh, for coming on the show and, 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 and sharing, sharing the story and uh, the learnings along the way. My, my pleasure, Simon. Again, anytime I can talk about my kids, um, just put a microphone in front of me. We'll do it. (laughs) <laughs> I'm proud dad great to yes, hear yes, see you again soon okay thank you thanks a lot thank you listeners goodbye